We've spent 13 wonderful weeks in the book of Revelation, and as Rob uh, shared, we're going to be moving to the next section of the series that begins next month, uh, entitled What's Next, as he mentioned last week, and uh, we're going to read and rejoice in the coming of, of Christ Jesus to usher in that new heaven and new earth. It's one of my favorite parts of Revelation. You know, after seeing all that war, destruction, and pain, well, John, he hears from the holy throne, that holy one, declare, behold, I make all things new. This glimpse that we get into really God's eternal plan, all things new, which the Bible teaches is, is really the consummation of of God's work going on right now, like this work of redemption and renewal in our daily lives. It's what Paul noted in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, when he encouraged us as the church to not lose heart because even though our outward man is perishing, Paul encourages us that our inward man is being renewed day by day. And in that same letter there in chapter 5, he most famously wrote, if anybody is in Christ, he is a, that's right, new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this definition of new that's here in 1 Corinthians and even in Revelation when God says, behold, I want to make all things new is, is not the same type of new that, that we know, like the new pair of flip-flops that I, I just got because my old ones have worn out over the summer and they're just going to wear out again. This is, this is a different kind of new, a divine new, a new new that's unprecedented, unheard of not only mended, one commentator would write, but we are made brand new. Because in Christ, we are a new creation which God owns as his workmanship and one whom he looks upon and pronounces it is good. I love that. That's so beautiful. God's desire is to continue in our lives this new, fresh work, this continued renewal until ultimately the day that the Bible teaches when we see him face to face and we are made like him. And that's what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about looking for a fresh work. That's our title for this morning, which is really just an encouragement to do just that as followers of Jesus, that we would be looking, seeking, desiring to see God working in us and through us in fresh new ways, just like he desires. And we're going to use this section in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that I've had you turn to as our reference and our outline where we're going to see three perspectives that we must have to usher in these fresh new works that God wants to do in us all. And if you're following along or taking notes rather, these three points are number one, looking back, number two, looking up, and thirdly, looking at the heart. An easy outline for us this morning, but these three perspectives that I know are going to require a measure of faith from us all. And, and I know that because we're kind of, you know, coming into the middle, coming in hot here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, just a little bit of, of context and backstory. At this time, in the moment where we're picking up in this book in 1 Samuel, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, well, they themselves were on the brink of a fresh new work. A real significant hinge point there in their existence. And, and from up until now here in 16, Samuel the prophet and Saul, who was the people's king, well, they have kind of made up the main focus of the story, like pretty much the first 15 chapters. And in that time frame, we understand that, that there came a point where the children of Israel, well, they had demanded a king. They demanded a king because this, this way of God directing them through the prophet Samuel was getting kind of old. I mean, Samuel was getting old, and the people fell into that, you know, grass is always greener type of mentality and uh, desired to imitate what they saw in the nations around them, where the other, you know, pagan nations had a physical king who sat on a physical throne, but, but really, ultimately, they were rejecting God and his desire to rule them. And so God allows them to choose this man, Saul, 
who would prove himself to be problematic, to say the least, disobedient, and a king after his own heart, culminating in God's rejection of King Saul. But now, here in chapter 16, we're going to be introduced to a new character, a young boy by the name of David. And David's introduction kind of overlaps this downfall that we see in the life of King Saul that would really ultimately prove to be more about his own fame than the Lord's fame. A self-centered and even, as we will read, a volatile character that, that kind of, uh, you know, left people fearing him, which ultimately is why God rejects him. And so that's where we're at. And with that, let's pick up. There in chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hears it? He will kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then Jesse invited, then invited Jesse to the sacrifice. I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And so it was, verse 6, when they came, that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For, the, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the young men here? And then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. And so he sent and brought him in. And now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him. For this is the one. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Let's pray. Father, what an intriguing story we have before us. And Lord, I pray that that as we today examine your word, Lord, I pray that you would examine us. Lord, and I pray that as our desires and and our heart, Lord, align with your heart today, that you would pour out your spirit upon us, Lord, that you would encourage us, that you would convict us, Lord, that you would empower us and make us more and more like you, Jesus. Lord, we do pray for our pastor, Pastor Rob and Denise, that you would be with them, that you would bless their time away and together. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. So when I say fresh new work, I'm, I'm wondering that there might be people here that are thinking like, well, what does that even, even mean? Fresh new work, what does that even look like? And I, I think it might be important kind of to discuss because when I think of fresh new work, well, right off the top, I think of those people that, that weekly come forward to surrender their lives over to Christ and in faith receive him, be transformed 
Their lives transformed. That radical change and miracle that, that we get to witness quite often, don't we? We get to see this miracle take place. Well, that's a fresh new work in those people's lives. Or maybe God's brought on a new season in your life, a season of victory, a season of new strength or new patience or new calling. Maybe it's a moment of deliverance or breakthrough. These are fresh callings. I'm sorry, fresh works. Maybe there's a a situation that seemed hopeless or bleak or dark and, and God just shows up, provides what you have been praying for. That's a fresh work. And lastly, I'm reminded of my own personal need for revival. I mean, in all honesty, this is kind of a a daily thing where I need God's forgiveness and faithful restoration in my life on the heels of my sin. I think of David's prayer, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Like on the heels of his sin, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And God is faithful to do just that. That is also a fresh new work. We recognize that this subject of renewal well, it definitely has its importance for us as believers. And so to emphasize this realization, we look at our first perspective today, which has to do with looking back. And if you would read that first portion of verse one again with me, it says, now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Stop right there. I... I think what a fascinating question this is that God asks of Samuel. How long will you mourn for Saul? Like for God to look at the heart of, or look in this, inside this man's heart and by way of his question, say to Samuel, Samuel, you're grieving over something that you should no longer be grieving over. Now think about that. God didn't say, hey, Samuel, why are you mourning? As if to say that he shouldn't be saddened at all. No, he simply asks, how long? How long will you mourn for Saul? Meaning that there was an issue there with the length of time that Samuel was allowing this to continue and maybe the other things that it may have hindered in his life. You see, this first reminds me, like right off the bat, that God acknowledges our pain and our sorrow. We have to know that and understand that. The scriptures make that clear. In Psalm 34, 18, we're reminded that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And in Psalm 56, verse 8, we're told that God keeps track of our sorrows. He collects our tears in his bottle and records them in his book. God recognizes and remembers our times of sadness and grief, and he uses them for a great purpose. But we also find some need for healthy temperance and limits in all of this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're told to everything there is a season, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And in Psalm 30 verse 5, We're told that although weeping may stay for the night, rejoicing comes in the morning. So we see through the scriptures and through God's question to Samuel that it serves a reminder to us that while mourning and grief are natural, right? These are God-given emotions, even sometimes necessary for us to process these moments. We need to be mindful. We need to be careful to not allow our grief and sorrow to exceed their expiration date. Maybe be careful to not allow grief and sorrow to have rule over us, control over us. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 that although we have freedom, like all things are lawful, that not all things are helpful, especially to the point where something may have control or master over us, keeping us from what God may have us to do. Now, what must be said here is this is by no means an exhaustive, you know, study on what it's like to grieve the loss of a loved one. I want to be very careful because I most certainly do not know what that is like, but I have people that are very close to me 
who are on their journey of sadness and grief, who have lost a loved one, dealing with that ongoing fallout from losing somebody so close, like a parent or a child or a family member or a close friend. But what I can say that I've witnessed being around these people, many of my dear friends who have suffered loss have been a shining example to me and many others of what it's like to walk that journey in grace to walk that journey in courage and to walk that journey of grief while still being obedient to God. What Samuel's example gives us, though, are those many other parts of life, relationships, work, and in ministry that can leave us saddened, that can cause us to be frustrated or bitter or even angry, that can kind of hold on and stay for much too long within our heart and mind. Or we're self-pity and shame that can distort our identity, like when we're you know, dealing with our own faults and failures, man, these can become a stumbling block for us. Or they can weigh us down and prevent us from stepping out and being used. And for Samuel, it might have included some of this self-pity for the part that maybe he had played. But listen, God's intervention was there to admit, yes, Samuel, this didn't turn out the way that we'd hoped. You know, it is a bummer. And of course, there is much to grieve about, but now it is time to move on because I have something new and fresh that I want to do in your life and in the people's lives. And you know what? Sometimes God has to come to us and ask us that same question. How long? How long will you sorrow over that loss? How long will you grieve over that mistake that was made? How long will you allow that hurt, that frustration, or that misfortune to stunt or keep you from living the life that I've called you to? and those fresh new works that I have planned and ordained for your life. Yes, God would say, I know it is hard. I know it's painful. I recognize that. I know you made a mistake. I know it wasn't fair. The list goes on and on. But the Lord would say to maybe you and me, hey, now it's time to get up. Maybe it's time to take that off, leave it behind, because I have something for you to do. Maybe that's God's word to you this morning. Something to note here, and it's important to note this, is that the scriptures are filled with instances where God's people are directed to look back, to remember the past, both in the Old and New Testament. Not only to remember the past, but to learn from it, right? That we would reflect those moments and and especially commemorate those uh, times of of victory in the Lord and commemorate God's grace and deliverance in our lives from the mountaintops to the valleys, from the flood all the way to the cross at Calvary that we would remember our past. And this is a very necessary part of our Christianity. But again, to allow our past to hinder the work of God in our lives can be detrimental harmful and lead us to missing out on really the wonderful life-giving opportunities that God has in his kingdom's work. It's the reason Jesus called us to come in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all of you who are weary and, and carrying these heavy burdens. I will give you rest. This is the key. If we are carrying these burdens, holding on to this frustration and sorrow and grief, that we would come to him and give him these burdens. And in exchange, he says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. You see, Jesus invites us to bring these burdens that we carry to him, to let them be at his feet, to take his yoke, which is easy to bear and light. This, my friends, is the only way forward in experiencing new and fresh works that God wants to do. Another question for you is, after doing that, I wonder what God might be calling you to do. What fresh new work 
in the confidence of Christ that he would ask you to step out in for such a time as this. So let's talk now about looking up. That was looking back, looking up, and at the direction here in 1 Samuel 16 that God gives to Samuel to grab his oil and go, man, you think Samuel would be excited to, to, to kind of find that horn that maybe, you know, that was filled with oil that he'd put away to kind of dust it off and grab it. It's time to go, but that's not exactly how Samuel reacts. Verse 2, Samuel says, how can I go? And if Saul hears it, he'll kill me. And you can't blame Samuel for this reaction, right? I mean, of all people, and he knew Saul. He knew his jealous and volatile nature and, and had witnessed how afar off Saul's heart had gone from the Lord. And he seemed to kind of come to that notion of murder pretty quickly, right? So, yeah, it was like his first conclusion. Man, if he knows what I'm up to, he's going to kill me. But even after hearing God's great news that I had provided myself a king, Samuel's initial reaction was fear. I think we can all understand that. I can totally understand those challenges that come, you know, with our horizontal humanity, we might call it. And we can all understand because this would be typical of our own natural response to something that we deemed dangerous. And it was dangerous. I mean, it wasn't, you know, like Saul just had really bad breath and Samuel's like, really? Please, Lord, no. No, he was afraid of his own life. Saul was a real threat. And we also experience bouts of this same reaction, our horizontal humanity when we're faced with challenging situations. Maybe we're not facing a madman like Saul, but man, we're fa you know, faced with the many fears that we all engage with, like the fear of maybe making ends meet for the month or the fear of being, you know, uh, failing those people whom depend upon us. It's a very real fear. Uh, there could be a fear of, of, of sin or temptation or, or maybe even looking to the future, the fear of what our future may hold. Maybe there's a fear over your children, where they're headed or wondering what they'll become or not become. Listen, whatever the reason may be for you, Samuel's reaction here, it gives me hope. It gives me hope and here's why. Because we notice that there is no immediate condemnation from God. There's no rebuke. Instead, what God does in response to Samuel's reaction is he provides a solution. God provides a solution. Isaiah 41.10 encourages the Christian, be not dismayed or fearful, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, help you, and uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, there's been many a time that I've had conversations with friends where they are experiencing bouts of fear, maybe bouts of doubt and worry, and, and, and these initial reactions have caused them to think that they've already lost. You know, and my, my response to them is, wait, hold on a sec, because how would you know courage if you first hadn't experienced fear? Like, how would we know what courage is like if we weren't faced with fear and had to choose to obey God despite our humanity screaming at us, keeping us from stepping forward? How would we know what courage is if we hadn't experienced fear? Or how would we know what trust is if we first haven't wrestled with doubt? To choose trust over doubt. It's the same concept that Paul pointed to in regards to the subject of contentment there in Philippians chapter 4. He said, I have learned now how to be content. You see, there was a process where Paul had to learn these things. These things just don't come at an instant, do they? He says, I've learned to be content everywhere and all things. I've learned to be full, hungry, to abound, and to suffer need for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's what we have to learn. Apart from our humanity and our initial reactions, that we can do all things through Christ. We can together say, you know, that we are learning to be faithful 
everywhere and in all things. We're learning when we're faced with uncertainty to believe God at his word for we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And that, that wording there in that verse in Isaiah 41, be not dismayed, well, it speaks more of a lasting gaze, like where, where our focus is fixated on that horizontal and refuse to kind of change our perspective. Our eyes are fixed on the horizontal, but God's encouragement to us is to look up, to look to him, and there is where our focus should be. His encouragement to us now in the face of our human limitations is to look to him and like Samuel to obey his direction. And in this, my friends, this is when our faith is deployed. This is when we learn. This is when we grow. And this is when we can say like Paul, man, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be faithful. I've learned to face my fears and be courageous. And the scriptures are filled with instances of great men and women of faith falling into that trap of staring and focusing, looking at that obstacle, looking at our enemy, or focusing on our own weakness and inabilities and experiencing the paralysis that can hold us back. And listen, I've experienced that way too many times. Here in 1 Samuel, God lays out a plan for Samuel, a strategy for him to avoid the danger. Read there the second half of verse 2 and 3. But the Lord said to Samuel, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. Now, some may wonder, hey, is, is God telling Samuel to lie? Is he asking him to lie? And the answer is absolutely not. But the strategy that God gives is quite covert, you know, a little undercover, adding the sacrifice here into the mix. But it's not a lie. One commentator noted that deception is something that's only, you know, allowed in sport and war, for only a fool allows his opponent to know his strategies. Now, I remember one Christmas, somebody gifting Rachel and I this, you know, Star Wars-themed electronic battleship set, you know, and, and so we opened it up, and, you know, we're playing, and, and Rachel would call out a coordinate, you know, like B5, you know, and I would go, miss, you know, and then so her subsequent, you know, coordinates, she'd be like, well, B6, B4, you know, A5, C5, miss, miss, miss. She's like, what, what the heck? I thought I was close. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> to which she, you know, stood up and was like, you're cheating. And I said, what, what are you talking about? She's like, you, you lied. You're, you're cheating. And, and, and I said, this isn't cheating. This is Battleship 101. Like, everybody <laughs> knows this is war. And now she won't play games with me anymore. But, you know, God's plan was not deceptive, but it protected Samuel and giving him this legitimate reason to go to Bethlehem. But more importantly, listen, God's plan that he gave Samuel, it included anointing David. And so Samuel could be rest assured based off God's word that this would come to pass. That Saul wouldn't be a factor at all, even though, you know, his tendency was maybe to, uh, to act in a mad uh, way. But because it was Saul who was, uh, although it was Saul who was still king, listen, God ultimately never left his throne or authority into the, man, into the hands of a sinful man, right? Right? God had a larger plan that required the faith of Samuel and included his anointing. Although his direction led him to Bethlehem and to the house of Jesse, listen, God would reveal to Samuel David later, but his word was that he would anoint for himself this new king. And we see the same principle at work in us and the challenges that we face, again, with our own uh, horizontal humanity, right? 
as Paul rejoices in his letter to the church in Philippi, that he could be confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes those thoughts of fear and worry or doubt, they may come initially, they may exist, but listen, looking unto Jesus, who's given us his word, who's given us his promise, who's told us to keep our eyes fixed on him as Hebrews 12.2 exalts as the author and finisher of our faith, that he will make a way, that this is our solution. And I believe the more opportunities the Lord provides for us with these challenges, we, like Paul, we can encourage, as Paul, I'm sorry, would encourage, we could become confident that our God is faithful and true and in control and on the throne. Another tendency can be maybe a self-focus, right? Again, a dangerous focus that takes uh, our, our, our focus off of Jesus. And, and I know that when we think about ourselves, of course, there's always going to be flaws that we can notice and, and recognize. There's always going to be something to it, you know, for us to point at a negative aspect about our flesh and its weakness. But listen, that's kind of all a part of the mystery that God would even choose and, and, and use imperfect people like you and like me for his glory's sake. It's a mystery. It's the reason Paul would include those lines in his letter, like in his letters where he was, he was constantly like, man, I'm the least of the apostles. Like I'm the, I'm the chief of sinners. But yet here's what God says, right? I mean, we can all relate to that. But sometimes we can get so hung up staring and focusing there on our flaws Again, we can lose sight of Jesus. Whenever, you know, I have the uh, privilege of officiating a, a wedding, you know, that part always comes uh, in the ceremony where I get to say to the groom, all right, now it's that time of the wedding where you get to kiss your bride. You know, it's a beautiful moment in those ceremonies and, and a huge picture opportunity, you know, of the day, getting that shot where the groom has, you know, got his bride over and he's kissing her. And, you know, and I know that this is coming. I know that picture opportunity. And I've been reminded way many two times, hey, when you do that, can you please just step out of the way, you know? Can you just, like, move? So, you know, because we don't want you photobombing this beautiful moment, this, you know, bald guy in a tight suit. But... Yeah, just kind of getting out of the way and getting him into focus. And sometimes I hear this, you know, God say the same thing to me. Like, hey, get out of the way. I know you're imperfect. I know you have flaws, but I want your focus on me. I want to help you. I want to guide you and give you strength and the confidence that I've called you to do this and produce in you fresh new works. So the encouragement is don't focus on your flaws the Lord knows them. It's not time to, you know, stare at our imperfections, but, man, through the blood of Jesus Christ, to find forgiveness and redemption and to step out in faith in obedience to God and watch him work and watch him move and just be amazed. Amen? Amen. So that's looking up. So lastly, let's talk about looking at the heart. Back to our story there in 1 Samuel, verse 6. For the sake of time, we'll just read those two verses. So it was when they came and they looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Stop right there. You know, we read how, you know, Jesse sends his seven oldest to pass before Samuel. Neither of them are God's choice until Samuel asks, man, is this everybody? Are these all your sons? Well, the youngest is out, you know, in the fields watching our sheep. Samuel says, hey, send for them. And this young boy shows up smelling like sheep, probably sunburnt, you know, and God says, this is him. Arise, anoint him. And this amazing story here exposes the pretty clear contrast between God's perspective and man's. 
Just like any of us, when Samuel sees the oldest, sees Eliab and, and thinks based off of maybe the previous king, Saul, you know, gosh, he's tall, he's good looking, he's kingly. This must be God's choice. But God corrects Samuel, doesn't he? He teaches us that often our judgments, man's judgments, are influenced by these external factors, whether it's appearance, status, or experience. And this does not only have to do with people. This can be the experiences that we have and opportunities and struggles that we have and trials. But, but listen, God's perspective that he's teaching us, and it's not some rando mystery. No, God looks deep. He sees and values the inner character and potential in this young boy that Samuel couldn't initially see. The same with us. When he sees in a, a moment of time or a, a challenge that he's giving us or a trial, he sees the value, the character that will be developed, and the potential that this could produce in you and in me. That's God's perspective. You see, later in our story, we find out that God's work in David's life started long before this moment. Yes, he was the youngest of the bunch, sent to watch over the sheep, given the lowly responsibilities, but, but God took this young boy and prepared him. He, he tested him with the lion and the bear and spent time communing with David through his meditations and his music. And what happens here in chapter 16, this anointing in front of his brothers and his father, this fresh work in the history of God's people, well, it wasn't random at all. But instead, it was all a part of a beautiful plan that God was bringing to fruition. In the very next chapter, we see this young boy. We see David again called by God to rule, anointed but still tending the sheep well, we see him, still a shepherd boy, slay the mighty giant. And this is what Samuel couldn't see. This is what he couldn't see, but God saw all along the potential in this young boy and this fresh new work that he could produce in and through him. Now, if we take that lens, we turn it on ourselves, focus on our own current situation. Whether if it's a season of trial or ex extreme challenge that we're facing in the moment whether you're overwhelmed with what's on your plate or the responsibility, that burden that we talked about that you're carrying, it's a heavy one. Maybe you're in the midst of a battle, fighting sin, fighting temptation, desiring a breakthrough, desiring and asking God for victory. Maybe, you, maybe you've been wanting and praying for an opportunity. You know, you feel that God has called you, he's anointed you, but man, you feel like you're still in the, the fields with the sheep or things just haven't turned out the way that you hope. Listen, whatever the case may be, the truth of the matter is God is involved and at work. God is involved at work and, and he sees you and he knows your value. The Bible teaches you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He is preparing you, he's preparing me through the seasons of our life for fresh new works. Charles Spurgeon preached that the testing teaches us who we are, that it digs up the soil and lets us see what we are truly made of. And listen, I stand before you as a man that has learned more from my mistakes than anything else in my life. I've been dug up several times to expose the work that is still needed to be done, areas of patience and humility, trust and faith. I think we can all relate to Peter who faced his own testing, you know, that we get to witness throughout the Gospels. Man, we have that front row seat as he goes through that testing in his time spent with Jesus to the point where he would write in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, be glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials, it's only for a little while, and they'll show you that your faith is genuine as it's tested by fire, as fire tests and purifies gold. And listen, just like I said, we, we have that front row in Peter's life, seeing all that go down, and just as the early church witnessed, God did a fresh new work in this humbled man to produce one that he could use 
for this fresh new work, for that early church. God's hope for us is that through his spirit, we could adopt his perspectives, that we could see value, potential in the midst of our moments and trials and struggles, frustrating moments or, or even just waiting for God to answer a prayer or open a door and by trust allow him to orchestrate his beautiful plans in and through our lives. But we must adopt this discipline. We must learn to look at the heart, looking beyond those external circumstances. Yes, we'll have those initial reactions, but then it's time to be obedient, to step out in faith and watch the Lord work and move as we take the time to examine the heart of the matter. The Lord will reveal his will, his perfect will for each and every one of us.